The visits to Cork of both President Mary Robinson and Minister for Health Michael Noonan. We attend the launch of the Cork Counselling Centre's fundraising campaign and in part two we speak with spiritualist healer Mary Malone. President Mary Robinson visited Cork yesterday, included is a spiritualist healer who originally comes from Galway. Healing has taken her around the world 12 times, visiting 172 countries. As part of her upcoming tour of Ireland, Mary will be visiting Cork during the month of March. To find out more about this extraordinary woman, I spoke with Mary Malone. Can we ask you to tell us a little bit about your background, first of all? Okay, I'm the oldest of four. I have one sister and two brothers. I was brought up in a home where, which was quite religious and where there was a grandmother and grandfather and my mum and dad, of course. We all had the gift on my father's side, yet we never made anything about it. We had the vision, I had vi the visionary since I was um, two and a half, and yet I never mentioned much about it other than I played with the, the children, which were like guardian angels and I wasn't aware of that. I thought they were the village children at the time. And that continued until I was 11 years old. And I was sick many, many times. Now, going back for a moment, I was uh, born five weeks premature. And I found out since, if you are brought into the world earlier, that it, and the angels help you through it, that you have that vision or you have some gift, mm -hmm. you know? Usually it's either healing or you'll have something to do with medicine as well. And this was a part of, of uh, growing up, of course. We, I was brought up in a very, very loving home. We all loved one another. If it was only just going to the toilet, we'd, we'd hug one another type of thing, you know? So there was, no, uh, there was no negative things with us when we loved our neighbors and things like that. I was quite religious all my life because I think in some ways it came from my grandmother. She always had us on her knee and praying. Mm -hmm. It has brought me, when I was 11 years old then, I had my appendix out. And I lost my vision after that. I lost the children, I should say. And um, it didn't come back again to me until I was 21 and I was over in the States. And it's, it's funny, you know, you cannot tell anybody. I had to keep all this to myself, especially when I found out that number one, there weren't the village children I was seeing. And now, here I was a grown up woman that loved life and loved laughter and the voice within me was saying that this is what they wanted me to do. So I had a battle for years and years, I had a battle not to go out in the world. I was single, so how could I step out in, any, in anything on my own? And where was I hearing it from, what, you know? I knew it wasn't my imagination because I'd, he I'd hear it so clear, you know? Tell us a little bit more about that, about the way it would manifest itself, the way your gift, the way you would hear things. I remember reading a piece about you and you used to almost turn around as if there was somebody That's behind right. you. That's Tell right. us a little bit more about well, it. Well, that it is so loud. I still get that up to this day and not every day, of course. But I could be walking down the street and it's as loud as the first thing I'd hear was Mary very loud and I'd stop in my tracks. Now at times it could be my own sister's voice that I will hear shouting me. So you're close to somebody. But when, you're, when I get the man's voice uh, coming in and, and telling me what to do, you know, then I stop and listen to it. Or I, I could be saying my rosary, I could be talking to anybody when that will come in. And it, you know, the only way that you'd know is my eyes seem to glaze for that second. You know, when I mm -hmm. hear the voice. And I often wonder when I'm talking to somebody, gee, do they see that or do they know what's going on with mm -hmm. me? Because I have to stop and listen to it, what has been said to me. You, you can tell things about people very quickly, Mary, can't you? I Even can. people that you don't see, people, right. for example, at the other end of a phone. Tell us about that. Or the other end of the world, if they, if they ring me up, you know? And, it, and that's a fu uh, it's fun as well. There's nothing that's not fun with me. I love laughter, you know? Uh, and I love love to give to people, and I love people. Um, when, I, when that happened to me first and people started ringing me up, I wasn't really aware that I could do it, you know, that I could see them and help them if they were in hospital or if they were at home and not knowing what the doctor was finding, if anything. And I could tell them exactly what was wrong mm. and that to go back to the doctor. And now, I can't explain to you how I can do that, all I know I can do it. 
So it's not me. I'm only an instrument. And what comes out of my mouth is somebody else talking through me, you know? And it's a big responsibility in some ways, and yet I know it's so accurate, mm -hmm. you know? I know, if, like for instance, if somebody was in a coma and the family rang me up and I can describe what I'm seeing. And I, now I put out the healing that I do with everybody and through a bit the Holy Spirit, not through Mary Malone at all. Um, I, I give them the healing or I, I say those prayers and then I go into prayers for three hours a day, every day. You know, I cannot just pray today and then not pray tomorrow. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be right because I have a weight myself on me for people that ask me for prayers mm. so i have to to pray for them i'm lucky that i have a priest that helps as well wonderful healer and he comes in and helps even with the masses and with his prayers when did you notice the healing aspect of things i mean you said that you've had your visions for most of your life really most of my life when did when did you notice something to do with healing right now uh, as i said to you before i was sick as well practically all my life in some form or another you name it I got it but I only got a touch of it I never got the full thing that would put me into hospital so I was and I never made a big deal about it I could go out of my home feeling absolutely great and come back and I, I'd be so sick I could hardly stand up and to trick her off something while I'd be out I was I was used to it so I didn't make a big deal I I always prayed to Padre Pio when maybe 15, 20 years I was praying to Padre Pio and he came through one morning, and early one morning and I could feel my flesh burning and I woke my husband, Malcolm, and I said there's something wrong with my flesh and he said we'll deal with it in the morning as he go back to sleep, <laughs> like any good husband to do, you know, <laughs> don't wake me up at this time in the morning and uh, when, I, when I woke up my pads were, you see my, those pads I have here, mm -hmm. my healing pads. And They're the very raised. Yes, and the voice says to me as I was praying, which was Padre Pio, uh, go out and give, your, give, give the love to the people by your healing. And that was how it all started in a very simple way. Now, I just didn't get up and go out and start that either. That was something I had to mm. pray on. And you've you've travelled yeah. all over the world, m more than once as well, I hasten right, to add. Times. You've been to some fantastic yeah. places. Yeah. Are people always welcoming of you, Mary? Yeah. Are they always happy to see oh, you? Oh, they are. They are. Like over here, you know, you, when you go away and come back, they, lo they love to see you again. And you will get the odd negative person, won't you, in every job. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're doing something good, if you're happy. There's some people, of course, that don't understand that. How is it that I can be so happy when I, uh, when we're living out of four suitcases and we're up and down like yo-yo? That is a part of what I was asked to do, give everything up and go out in the world. Now, I couldn't do that on my own. I had to have the help and the help and the love of my husband, which I think he has given up a lot more than I would ever give up because as long as the sky wouldn't fall in me, I wouldn't worry, mm -hmm. you know? So it was easier. Uh, to do to do that. Plus, he wasn't a Catholic at the time. Thank God. Uh, last year, he turned to Catholic, and he didn't turn for me because I wouldn't let him turn for me. He had to turn for the love of God, and that was a calling he got. And uh, we worked together. We were like hand in glove. When you do go to different countries, you obviously have met very, very different religions, very, very different cultures. As we know, the world is is, is full of different cultures. Right. Is it easier? to work with a person who is religious or isn't religious or does it matter no it doesn't really matter i look at everybody that they're all god's children and we're all put here for a purpose and we're all here to help one another whether they're whether they're catholics protestants or no religion god we our prayers and everybody else that prays helps that person that doesn't believe in anything anyway you know it's just like when you'd hear somebody saying oh that child died and wasn't um, either baptized or what God is won't bring anybody into earth and then throw them aside that's not how God works at all God is full of love and mercy for everybody but we need we either need to, to pray for those that has no faith. You don't shove down the faith down their throat because that's not really what we're here for either. But with your own actions, whoever is around you will see it and they're drawing into mm. it. 
you know. I go, just go out, I mean, even on the street and I talk to people. When we're in South Africa, I would sit on the, on the street and talk to the people. And you wouldn't ask them what religion they were, but you would bring the closeness of God around them mm. by talking to them and giving them the healing. Just by even talking, there's healing, you know, as mm. well. And I don't, uh, I never see anything bad in anybody, you know. Even if they were the roughest of the roughest to me, I would never, you know. I would bless them and let them go. So when you go to different countries and you have open sessions, as, right. as you do, you invite yes. people to come along. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes along, what do you actually do? What happens at these the sessions? First, yeah, the first thing that I do, of course, is I, I have a talk with the people. And then I go into my rosary and my prayers, my healing prayers. And, after, and that takes quite a while because I explain to the people about healing, mm. you know. And there can be people out in that uh, crowd as well. You could get up to 500 people, 700 people has been there. And there could be people in that crowd that are healers themselves. As long as that we, we pray because we are taking other people's illness with us in our hands. You know, you have, the Holy Spirit is working through you, whether you're, uh, whatever religion you are, you know, he's given us all a gift and he can give anybody the gift of healing, but they have to pray. So I explain what healing is. I explain how, how to pray, how to bring the Holy Spirit close into you, and that not to have any hatred or, um, hatred or jealousy or anything mm. like, you know, that kind of thing. They shouldn't have any of that with them if they're going to serve God in their own way. I then, each and every one comes up to me for healing and I give them about two minutes and that two minutes that you only have to leave your hand really in them and some of them are healed immediately. Some may not be healed uh, in what their condition but the soul is healed. Mm. You know, and I get hundreds of letters saying you brought me back to my church, whatever church and a lot of them of course with the Catholics that if they fell away they go back the calling is there then. They wouldn't be there if God didn't want them, you see. Just like we're going to Medjugorje or Lourdes or you have to be called or you wouldn't be there. And it's the same way with healing. Um, it's just simple what I do. There's nothing big and mighty about it. Well, I leave it's everything to you. To God. <laughs> I, yeah, I leave everything to God. You don't like the term psychic, is that right? No, no, because I don't see it in that way. Mm. I ca couldn't see nothing in cards, I couldn't see nothing in crystal balls or anything like that, you know? And yet I can read the writing on a glass of water, which is great big writing that comes in. Mm. And that helps me that I don't have to, um, I don't have to use my own brain really. You know, Do you believe in, in people that people can be psychic, people can read things in cards? Oh, yes, but I wouldn't want to be a part of it mm. because I'd be frightened. I wouldn't know what to do myself. And uh, I think you have to know your job, you know, that you wouldn't bring any kind of a darkness. Mm. I think though, my ans my, if they asked me, if a psychic a asked me um, what I thought, I think I would, the first answer I would give them is always make sure that you pray before you, you give any help to anybody that would sit in the front of you because no way should anybody give a message of death, number one. No way should they uh, give a dark side or, you know, um, make them feel as if, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for here. Um, like you were saying about the positive as opposed to the negative. Yeah, there's a dark side with cards, mm. you see, or anything like that and they, they shouldn't work on that. Mm. They could be, I mean, there's wonderful psychics out there and has done wonderful jobs, mm. you know? Mm. Uh, but they, need to, they all need to pray. I know one woman that writes to me and I know she's a fantastic woman, but she's a psychic lady, but she prays a lot and she helps people and she suffers a lot because of the cards, unfortunately. Because, like you, she, you, you have to take a certain yeah. amount of, of the person that you're yes. dealing with. Well, in when terms of because I was sick mm -hmm. off and on all my life, when I got the calling, I said, Dear God, you are, he was picking, I mean, a, a, bro a broken bowl type of thing, you know. How well, was I going to be able to help anybody when I could be sick tomorrow myself, not being able to travel? Mm -hmm. And yet I was asked to travel. I never felt sick after that. My health just got better and better and better after I'd taken it up, and walking out in God's footsteps, mm. you know. Well, we know that there are an awful lot of people eagerly awaiting your visit to Cork. It's the 13th of March at Christie's Hotel in Blarney. That's right. And the 14th at the Munster Arms Hotel in Bandon. Right. 
What can we expect then well, from the you, Mary? Right, well, the doors open, of course, at five o'clock if they want the tickets there. Um, again, like I do all over the world, it'll be no different here than we'll be all over the world. And I'll have probably a half an hour talking to the people, then saying the rosary and the healing prayers. I also do a meditation that's a wonderful meditation that uh, a nun gave me, again in, from Dublin, and I'll do that for them. I'll bring them into the Holy Spirit that they'll feel the flow of God around them. And after that we'll do the healing and we'll do the healing individually, regardless of who's there. And that's where we leave you on Cork today for this evening. Don't forget to join us again at the same time tomorrow evening when for Sports Extra, Gerald McCarthy speaks with former... Don't you feel about it, all right? Just do go. You're early. Oh, no, we're late. I haven't even had a chance to change. It was my fault. I might get my stick for it, but don't worry. She's going to put her glad rags on the ladies' loo. Well, don't do that. Use my room, 255. Oh, no, I couldn't, really. There's two sets of towels and one of me, and I never use a shower cap. Oh, well, that, that really is very kind. Can you take the ladies' uh, bag up to 255? Of course, sir. Well, we might be as well off, eh? Who says that, then? Baldwin. It says they're completely one-sided contracts. They've got the right to crucify you, basically. And if they do break it, they just say, Suze, so it costs you a fortune in time and money. It doesn't get you anywhere. And it takes forever to get around to paying you anyway, then. Sounds like exactly what we're doing now, only in larger numbers. Yeah. Oh! Does anybody know whose bag this is? I've just snagged my tights on. Flaming Norris, the juju bag. So you've been round the uh, four corners, have you? Uh, yes, and I've squared it with my friend. Ah, so you're coming in at the right angle. <coughs> um, so uh, what's your line of business then, Arthur? Low rate calibration equipment mainly. Oh, yes. And does that fit in with this trade? Oh, you'd be amazed, you know. They've got some of our equipment installed at Buckingham Palace. Really? I was there myself, you know, a few weeks ago. I never saw it. Now, let's sit down. Um, so what exactly is it? It's found another. Another what? Another square deal. Why do they bother with all the rigmarole? I don't know. I mean, I can spot them the minute I walk in. Yeah, I know what you've been saying, but what I'd like to know between grown-ups is, what's your make or break period? We really don't have a frame around that. Globally, yes, but it's a different question for each market. Yeah, but I'm talking about your market share a year from now. What would make you pull the plug? In the UK? No, we're not going to pull the plug. Oh, we're looking down the line here. We're not interested in cross ties. Why? Are you worried about what you're going to do with all those overmakes? Let me fill your glass. Excuse me. I, uh, I think I am for you. <laughs> Why's that? Well, I doubt you've ever been called a little woman. <laughs> well, I doubt it too. They'd be dead in a ditch. <laughs> can, I, uh, can I ask you something about Stephen? Why? Why, it's just that you two seem to have so much in common. Yeah, the business. And he's good company, but I get enough of it. Still, I do know what other women see in him. <laughs> you didn't lose my key, did you? No, 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 I've got it here. Actually, it's all right. Uh, keep it. You might need it for uh, getting changed later or whatever. So, did you, uh, did you go down to that wine bar? Uh, no, not in the end. It's funny, I thought you were keen. Well, yeah, but I can't get anybody to give me a straight answer. 
you ring up and they say, oh, he's out. It'll be, it'll be ten minutes. So then you ring back again and you find you're saying the same thing all over again to somebody different. <laughs> so in the end you think, I'm making a right fool of myself here. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know how that feels. So you didn't go then? No, I've said I didn't. <sighs> Still. Had a wee bit of luck. A little double come up. Oh. Fifteen quid. There was fifty quid in here last night. I gave it to Andy. <laughs> you gave it to Andy? <laughs> 